Hello, listeners. Hello, dear listeners. This episode, we're going to talk about using lived experience. Mm-hmm. Before we get stuck into it, how are you doing? Oh, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> but good, good. Cool. Yeah. How about you? Really, really tired. Oh, we're yeah. a tired bunch. Yeah, we are a tired bunch. Uh, little sleepy bugs. I guess that's a good tie-in to start mm. with the using lived experience by being open about how we're actually feeling and not being yeah. like, yeah, we're on top of the world. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, have I ever felt on top of the world? Probably not. This is probably how I know that I don't have bipolar. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> how about you? Have you ever felt on top of the world? I think I have. Yeah, there have oh. been brief periods where I've felt quite What's good. What's that like? It's pretty nice. Uh, good, good feelings of belonging and purpose and meaning. Okay. It's pretty good. That sounds pretty ace. With this, with this episode, tell sure. us. What are we talking about here? What is lived experience? Okay. So basically, I guess lived experience, what we're talking about in this context anyway, is I guess having a personal experience of mental illness and recovery. And that could be as the person who's experienced it or as the carer for a person who's experienced it. But basically it's having that, as the title suggests, you have lived through an experience in that realm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a new concept. You know, that there has been a few um, people that it's been around in for a while. A lot of people, you know, old, old mate, um, Freud's friend, Carl Jung, um, he was the one that came up with the concept of wounded physician, right? Mm. So that was kind of the whole concept of treatment as a partnership. Uh, and oh, I think I, I didn't know I came up with that actually. <laughs> uh, Why, well, if I if I've got my facts right? <laughs> yeah. Um, please correct us if <laughs> if we do say something Send wrong. Send your questions to <laughs> mentalworkpodcast.gmail.com. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or you know, just shout at us on social media yeah. like most people do. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he was the one that said something like, "Only the wounded, only the wounded physician can truly heal." Or something like that. So I guess that might bring me to something I kind of maybe discuss a bit later is do you have to have lived experience? Yes. Well, and that's what I was thinking. Mm. I was like, well, okay, so lived experience is living through an experience. And as mental health workers, why do we care about it? <laughs> I guess because it's it's the whole concept of how it feels, uh-huh. which can't necessarily be taught through academic knowledge. Ah. So you've got a whole bunch of, you know, different types of knowledge. Mm. Um, you've got your practical knowledge, your general knowledge, kind of your propositional knowledge, which you learn from a textbook. But then there's there has been this concept in, in therapy as well about kind of the whole person-centred practice is basically based around that experiential learning and the concept that that is required for personal growth and change. So it's really a therapist's position to be the facilitator of an environment. And that's where you get that whole Rogerian Carl Rogers. Oh, they're all called Carl, aren't they? <laughs> Why is every old therapist called Carl? <laughs> I think there's, um, I think a similar thing happens in academia. Like if you look through um, grants that are given to academics, it's like oh. you're 30% more likely to get a grant if your name is Paul or something. <gasps> Paul. Yeah. I'm not quite sure if Damn it's Paul, you, Paul, but it, it's some kind of name like that. But okay, so maybe you're a lot more likely to be an influential psychologist if your name is Carl. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I did have a Carl in um, one of my classes. Just Oh, what was he like? Was he a know-it-all? Because we're on the podcast, I'm going to say <laughs> Carl was a lovely person. Oh, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's like it's, it, is, it is a concept that's out there and it's been out there for a while yeah. of the value of having an experience in being able to help people with a similar experience. Yeah, because like when I was being trained in therapy, there's kind of two schools, which is really like... You are a blank canvas and Mm. you do not do, you do not reveal any part of yourself to the client patient. Mm. And then there's the other side of it. And I think this ties in with the Rogerian approach, which is like you are using what you know about pain and feelings to be able to empathize and facilitate for that person. 
Yeah. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's about creating a space. And I suppose it's if we look at that theory of the the theory saying experiential learning is required for personal growth and change, mm. then that would mean experiential learning is required for us to personally grow and change ah. as people and as therapists as well. Mm. So I guess that's a, it's an interesting concept, but but really where it kind of came up was in thinking about this topic was when you do study something like social work or psychology, mm. one of the questions that everyone asks you is, why did you choose social work? What made you choose psychology? Mm. Why, why, why? Because mm. <laughs> everyone's a nosy little bitch. <laughs> but... <laughs> But it basically that it does bring up a lot of internal questions around kind of self disclosure and things like that, and and how much do you do you tell people and reveal to people? Because often I think, like we've mentioned in previous episodes as well, um, a lot of us come into this field because of the personal experiences we've had, mm-hmm. and because we want to utilize those to help other people. Yeah, so it's that kind of why question of why did you choose social work and that kind of reflection that that brings about that kind of got me thinking about the whole lived experience malarkey. Yeah, (laughs) because there's this, like for me, it's like I do have lived experience of mental illness, but it's actually not the reason why I got into psychology. I did psychology in high school and I really enjoyed it. I liked conducting experiments and making, well, not making people, but, you know, like (laughs) I was the annoying one who went into classrooms like in year 11 and 12 and I was like, okay, everybody, can you do something for my experiment? Can you do your handwriting? I'm analysing handwriting for this experiment. <laughs> that is fascinating. And I, I guess there can be more than one reason as well, yeah, right? True. Like, yes. It, it doesn't have to be just one reason. Mm. It can be that we find these things fascinating as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's like because I have that lived experience as well, it has been a big kind of like thing for me that oh, people are going to find out almost Mm. and I've been told strictly to be against it like it's the client's time not your time when to self-disclose when not to use it it's a really it's a really tough 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 topic um I feel like it's quite taboo uh, among psychologists yeah it no it definitely can be Mm. um and I think you know elements of this have come up in the other episodes because it is just so pervasive yes into a lot of things but I mean realistically speaking you know if you just look at like mental health statistics alone that indicate that you know, a lot of us in the helping professionals have some sort yeah. of lived experience, right? Yeah. Because I, th- I think it was, um, so it's a the national survey of, of mental health and oh, wellbeing yeah. a little while ago. Mm. So like nearly one in two Australians age 16 up had experience of a mental health disorder in their lifetime. Yeah. So if it's not you, it's somebody you know. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So there's a lot of us out there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So it's like given that it's, it's like we're being put into a cage almost because it's like given that they're you know, 50% of us will either be someone or know someone who's Mm. experienced a mental health condition And then we're being told, I guess, all these very, very strict rules around when to disclose, how to disclose, how to use it to benefit our clients, our work. It's so difficult. It feels yeah. it feels hard to move within that space, like professionally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a bit of a bug, and it's that kind of traditional medical model kind of view of things, of of clinical approaches. And I think recently there has been a bit more coming out around this need for more holistic care. I agree. And mm. People are talking about having trans diagnostic mm. models of care and trans diagnostic approaches, being a little bit more innovative in that sense. And, and that's where it really brings up for me. So why not really utilize the experience of, of kind of the people that have actually been there as yeah. part of that? So like rather like trans diagnostic being that instead of being like you have anxiety, you have depression, mm. it's like you have distress. Yeah, basically. So it, it's kind of a more, it's not so much that boxed approach. It's looking across diagnostic categories. Yeah. Mm. So it's looking across, it's that, you know, someone, 
yeah, they might have anxiety, but they might also have elements of other things as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of taking into account this prevalence of comorbidity mm. and then looking at, okay, so if comorbidity is so prevalent, then what other things in common? Yeah. And how do we then work with with that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So it's kind of the angle that we've come to or have you come to is that, well, how can we use our lived experience, given it's so common to benefit our clients in our work? Yeah. And I guess it's, it is a bit of an interesting question because it does bring up the fact of, well, do you need to have lived experience? Yeah. So say, for example, when I used to work in family services, working on parenting programs, um, working mm. alongside like child protection and things like that, oftentimes I would be seen as not getting it because I did not have children myself. Oh, really? Yeah. So, you know, the question would always be, well, do you have children? Ah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I guess my response in that environment was it's not my job, a bit blunt, but it's not my job to be a parent here. It's my job Mm. to be a social worker. Yeah. But I did take that on board in terms of, yeah, I don't know what it would be like to have my kid taken off me. Yeah. I don't have experience in that sense. Yeah. What I do have experience in is knowledge in terms of, what works from an evidence perspective yeah. in terms of parenting programs, in terms of this and that. I always think this is a bit funny as well. Like mm. I do I do wonder whether there's a double standard almost because mm. nobody goes to say, let's say you've got cancer and you're going to get surgery for cancer. <laughs> yeah. I feel like down your list of questions, way, way down the bottom, if it's on your list of questions at all, would you be asking the surgeon, have you ever had cancer? <laughs> yeah. Like you're not, you just, you trust them to be a surgeon and to be able to do yeah. your surgery. But for psychologists, social worker, mental health workers, Mm. we're like, are you a parent? Uh, uh, Do you have that? Mm, You don't know. Yes, that's a really good analogy, actually, isn't it? The surgeon one. Mm. Yeah, because, yeah, you're right. You're not saying, like, have you had cancer or when you go to the GP because you've got, like, a UTI and you've got it. You're not saying, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Um, When was your last UTI, GP? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) um, You know, I'm not going to listen to what what you say unless you tell me (laughs) Yeah. um, how many UTIs you've had. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I got on the UTI thing, but <laughs> <laughs> and is that because we're working with people's minds yeah. rather than their bodies? Is is that? I think so. Like, I, I feel like perhaps this is reflective of the change in, in mental health over the decades. Like previously, perhaps patients felt like they were being told what their experience is and perhaps that's why they are on edge and are like, well, have you ever experienced this? You don't understand. You're telling me you understand, but but you actually don't. So I do feel like there is that kind of empathy aspect there. And so I wonder if almost these days in, I guess, modern times, we are expecting more of our professionals to really not tell us how we feel and and really understand and maybe use their lived experience to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, there is this kind of, um, particularly if we're looking at, you know, the NDIS world and yeah. everything that's coming out there, there is those um, that new space that's been opened up for recovery support workers. Yeah. And a lot of there are peer support workers mm. in community mental health settings a lot. So there is a recognition that that is valuable to people's recovery. Yeah. However, they're still kind of, at least from what I've seen when I was in the field, mm. they're still, they're paid less yes. than your allied health community mental mm. health workers. Yeah. So they're still undervalued in that sense that sends like a signal that that kind of experience-based knowledge is not as valuable. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I had the same, well, actually I wasn't paid at all uh, for right. the peer work that I did and I did it for quite, for a few years. Yeah. And- yeah, I, I found it very personally rewarding doing peer work. So I used to go out to high schools and deliver talks on mental health awareness mm. and use my personal experience as part of that. And I really enjoyed it. I was really well taken care of, except for the financial aspect. <laughs> yeah. But in every other aspect, I was very well taken care of by the organisation. I, I do agree. It does send that signal that maybe this experience-based knowledge is not as valuable. But then it seems that there's a call for it from the clientele themselves. Yeah. So if we were just looking at a a basic demand model, Mm. demand supply, 
then we really should be valuing that more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like I think there's a place, I do feel like there's so many gaps in the mental health system and I do feel like, yeah, peer work is incredibly valuable. It yeah. it was really meaningful to be able to connect with people and, and not have to, I guess, over-explain but be like, oh, they mm-hmm. get it straight away. Mm-hmm. And that was really as valuable to me as, say, like the psychiatrist. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a place for all this. And I'm just thinking of in my head at the moment, I know I'm always talking about food, but (laughs) in my head at the moment, I'm thinking of that taco ad where the little kid is like, why not both? (laughs) Um, That little kid has has a really good point. And I agree. Yes. You know, why can't we be? And I think there are a few barriers that are are stopping us, but there is still that kind of fear of judgment and fear of what the impact will be on my career. Absolutely. You know, because there is still that stigma around and that, as we're saying, that it's not as valued, that peer workers are somehow seen as lower on the rung Mm. than, um, you know, other types of workers when it's like, well, you can have both. Like you yeah. can also be a peer and a professional. <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like, yes, you you can. Like Taco Boy has a really great point. Um, I think it was a little girl. Oh, but you know it? what? Actually, we don't know we don't what know. her gender identity yeah. is. So <laughs> let's just say they. Yeah, they. They they had a really great point. But, and I feel like this is a big but, I just feel like I'm not allowed. I'm yeah. not allowed to have my own personal experience plus be a professional. I feel like I have to wear one hat and that's my professional psychologist hat Mm -hmm. and there's no way that I would as freely talk about my personal experiences or use them. I like I've deleted comments that I've written on Facebook where I might have disclosed something just a Mm. wee bit and I'm like, no, I've got to delete that in like our private psychologist Facebook groups and stuff Mm. Um, because, yeah, that that fear of, of being judged or known for that or being known as somebody who overshares that's a big yeah. one. Like you don't know how to properly utilize your experience. Oh, yes. Yeah, big. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember this counseling, when we did the counseling unit at uni, mm. we had to practice, you know, with our um, sh- other students. Yeah. And we had to get recorded and played back in front of the class. And and the instruction of the assignment was that we had to use real issues. Oh. But they were only supposed to be like four out of ten issues at oh, okay. max. Sure. Yeah. But that is really difficult. And mm. that can leave you feel it left me feeling intensely vulnerable. Because oh, I was really? like, oh, I'm experiencing like, how do I know what a four out of ten issue is? Yeah. Because on a day-to-day basis, at the time I was quite unwell and I was experiencing like, I don't know, what I would say is we're like eight out of ten issues on a daily basis. Mm. So <laughs> that's like that left me really, really anxious and feeling intensely vulnerable and I remember feeling so exposed mm. and like people were going to judge me for she's not ready to be a professional, yeah. she's not, you, you know, um, and I think that is really hard because on the one hand we're being instructed to work with real issues and mm. practice with them, but on the other hand, oh, make sure you don't go above a four because that's going to be unprofessional and how to get that balance. So I think that message was sent uh, for me anyway right from kind of being in uni and then coming out of uni, seeing how I guess where the peer workers were yeah. on the rung of things really yeah. reinforced that as well. I feel like that points to something important, which is like, yeah, same for me. My experience at uni was very strict, like do not use it, only use like this in this capacity. And then I feel like after uni, we aren't guided with how to use lived experience effectively because I think it can be a massively powerful tool. Um, But I feel like I'm still just as scared as I was at uni to be able to use it. And I'm just like, nope, that's an advanced skill. I can't use that. And so potentially in places where I could have used it effectively, I do not. And I think that's bad. It does the clients a disservice. The other thing is not having that pressure to disclose either because you need to check, am I in a place where I'm okay to be vulnerable Mm. as well? Mm. So it's not just about we don't always have to share and just because we do have experience of a certain thing doesn't mean we have to reveal that when it comes up in practice. So our personal experiences are our own. And we can use them if 
and when they are helpful. Mm. But it's good to check in with yourself to say, you know, what kind of place am I in? Because I think that that's where I've stumbled before is that I have disclosed when I'm not personally ready to or when I'm not feeling safe to or when I am in the midst of something. Mm. And then it has not necessarily been useful. And I'm not just talking here in kind of like disclosing to clients. I'm talking more like, you know, colleagues and um, supervisors and people like that as well. So other yeah. people within the industry. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So is that kind of like, it sounds like that's how you have found a way to kind of move forward in this space is really reflect on, am I actually ready to share this before yeah. sharing? Yeah, I think that's essentially the basis of it mm. is the why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I agree. Um, what's the purpose in this context? Yes. And am am I putting myself first in this as well? Yes. And I think an ex- you know example of I think it takes getting to know yourself. Yeah. So investing in kind of counselling for yourself as well is something that I would really recommend as like separate from professional supervision. So getting to know yourself, Mm -hmm. (laughs) getting to know what that process is like as a client, as a patient, Mm -hmm. because even if you don't, you don't necessarily have to have all the most complex mental health in the world, but knowing what it's like to be on the other side of that counselling process and the frustrations that might come up or, or, you know, things that might come up, um, when you are on that side, can be really useful. I agree, and yeah, and also just counselling is a great way to identify, I guess, your personal triggers, yeah, and explore your reactions. Whereas I found, and we're going to do an upcoming episode on supervision in this season, yeah, but I found that a lot of supervisors don't do that well. They don't actually. My, my personal experiences uh, mm. haven't guided me well through my reactions to clients and understanding that and facilitating why I reacted that way and could I have used personal experience? Well, I feel like that's being entirely neglected, but I feel like in counselling those things have been made more clear to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's, it's a different kind of ball game, the yeah. counselling as opposed to the supervision, yeah. although I think there should be um, more scope for that I within agree. professional supervision. Yeah, I would love that. I would, I, I, would <laughs> um, I would legit love that to be more included in yeah. supervision. That would be so helpful. Because I'm thinking of like mentorship in particular. Yeah. So like I know in my second placement I had a supervisor who, who I guess acted more like a mentor really. Yeah. And that was really vital to I had had a terrible first placement experience. Mm-hmm. And the second placement was really important to kind of rebuilding for me. Mm. And it was quite potentially triggering. So it was the same employer where I had previously been a a client as well as a a teenager. And, you know, a lot of the client stories coming through were very familiar to me. And I was being thrust into like a counselling role for the first time as well. Oh, God. Um, I had a supervisor. She was really good in being able to kind of identify where that line is in lived experience as well. So sharing some of her own as well as um, drawing that out of me. But Mm. for the most part, it was consciously acknowledging how things were impacting on me. So I think we, have you ever heard of like the rap thing? No, I haven't actually. So it's like this thing that's come out of the... I guess, um, self-determination and empowerment of, of clients. Is this like a global thing? Yeah, I think so. I think it might be America. I'm not quite sure, to be honest. Don't quote me on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Send your feedback but, to Metro Podcast. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it stands for Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And it's a thing that's come out of like the peer movement and things like that. Oh, sweet as. So it's like this plan that you can actually develop for yourself that looks at Kind of, it's about really being proactive about your own mental health. Ah, oh, nice. So looking at the kind of the early warning signs mm-hmm. for yourself, identifying who around you can help as well as the things you can do for yourself. Yes. And I think that kind of proactive approach, it, it demonstrates to, to those around you um, your level of insight and the steps you've already taken to practice self-care. That's really cool. We should, um, we'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah, hey. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think as well, not saying it's all your individual responsibility because yeah. as we yeah. said before, the organisation really does yeah. have <laughs> yeah. um, some, some responsibility for that. But I think 
having someone to kind of walk me through that yeah. was really crucial as well. So I think like, they- Did it help you relax a bit, like knowing that, mm. okay, I've got this plan in place. So if an employer brings it up, I can actually demonstrate to them I've given this some thought and I know exactly how to help myself? I think so. Yeah. And it was something that my supervisor wanted me to do. And I was a bit reticent at first because I wasn't sure how much to really disclose. Yes, But it's more about um, not necessarily disclosing all your past history, but Mm -hmm. it's about saying, this is what it looks like when I'm not doing well. Mm. And this is what can help me. That so, sounds really helpful. I'm going to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really great. It's, it's, it's really like in terms of just professional self-care as well, it's like yeah. ensuring your longevity in this profession. Like, you know, you, you have to know these things. Like you're doing a lot of emotional labour. That is yeah. like mental health workers. We do a lot of emotional labour. Yeah. Um, we have to work out how to take care of ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So I think that... Um, you know, where I would love to see the profession going as well is that kind of that mentorship for new workers really being inbuilt into the system. So you're not just having operational supervision. I agree. That's what I I agree. I'd love to see it go more because I've been reflecting on this myself and I'm like, yes, I need a supervisor for my case formulations and treatment Mm. plans. So I need Mm -hmm. that kind of directive guidance. Yes, I need my peers to support me, but I feel like there is that middle where I actually do need this mentorship and almost emotional support from supervision as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've seen a couple of job ads. It's it's not super common, but I have seen a couple of job ads recently where it'll say things like current or former consumers of mental health, really? strongly encouraged to apply, welcomes applications from qualified applicants with recovery experience. That is so cool. Uh, yeah, it's not very common. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I have seen a couple emerging, which yeah. is great. And some of the kind of leading mental health organisations do have like as part of their hiring panel, they'll have someone on the panel as a lived experience consumer or from a reference group or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So I think all those are really positive kind of I think of that's really positive steps. too. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, and it kind of signals that it's safe. You know, the same as organisations putting you know, the rainbow flag or something like that. It signals, hey, this is a safe space for people with lived experience. Yeah. Or this is a safe space for LGBT, you know, people. Yeah. Um, That's important. It is. I wish, I wish like, I wish we had that because that's what we need in psychology, perhaps in like other mental health fields, but we need something to signal like, hey, if you have a lived experience of mental illness, it's actually safe for you and to be Mm. in this profession. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to exclude yourself uh, you don't have to, you know, post on the forums and be like, I've had depression. Can I be a psychologist? Or yeah. y- y- I don't think you should think that way, like, or have to think that way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's going to take a little while for things to change, mm. but I think we can kind of start by changing you know, how we're doing things yeah. and leading the way is, oh, it sounds very <laughs> <laughs> grandiose, well, like, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I was kind of thinking like, I was like, okay, yes, that is that is nice. Or like, you know, nice picture. Like I do hope. Yeah. What, is, what are some of the like practical things that listeners yeah. can do to kind of take a step forward now? Like how can yeah. they use lived experience well now? Yeah. So I think um, invest in counselling for yourself. Yep. yep. Separate from professional supervision. If you're thinking about disclosing, ask why beforehand. What's the purpose? Mm. Is this useful to the client's experience? Like am I saying, you know, this is how I've dealt with with something or, you know, an idea that someone else has or this is a strategy that, you know, I've used, blah, blah, blah. Is that useful? Mm. And also putting yourself first. So, you know, your personal experiences are your own. There's no obligation to share and you can share if and when you are ready. And I I think, you know, for us asking for things like mentorship and hiring practices and things like that as well. Yeah. But I think even just getting to know yourself better. So having a look at that rap model, Mm. like, you know, filling out some parts of that, that'll indicate to you, you know, what are the pieces of this that are going to be useful to share with clients. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that would be fantastic. Mm. Like I, I wish I had that. I kind of have like a roadmap in my head. So it's like, um, yeah. for instance, because I have a family member who has a disability, I know that I'm quite passionate about that area. And it makes me actually, it makes it hard for me to work in the disability field because I am such a gung-ho advocate. Yeah, And so I know that I'm applying my own stuff over what the client might necessarily want. And mm. then that's unhelpful. So it's yes. like, it's good to have a roadmap in your mind. Take notice. That's how I found, I guess, to step forward. Um, I also got, I didn't actually get, you know, like when I was recovering from my stuff, to be honest, I didn't get much psychological help. It was mostly Mm. a lot of self-help, but I did a lot of my own processing to the point where somebody can come in the room with something very similar to me. And I don't feel that urge to be like, me too. I've experienced that, which I think is really helpful. But then I also have the choice because I've done that processing to make judicious use of it, that if I need to say, or if the client is looking for something, then I can use that quite well. I don't know how to tie that up into a box with yeah. a little bow on it, but it is. Yeah. I like I like what you were saying about knowing yourself quite well yeah. and recognizing that it's okay to be a human as well and have your own experiences. It doesn't make you flawed. I do wish there was that extra space in the professions to allow us to be human. Yeah. But in the meantime, I guess don't <laughs> stigmatise yourself. Yes, that self-stigma yeah. is a nasty one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's already enough stigma out there. Let's not self-stigmatise as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, like it's okay to yeah, it's okay to be a human and have experiences. And just in your yeah. with your professional hat on, you need to, like you say, ask yourself, why, think about it, um, mm-hmm. ask yourself, mm-hmm. like, why am I doing this? Make it deliberate. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, make it deliberate. And I think looking after yourself in the interim as well. Yeah. So that's a wrap. <laughs> that's a wrap. It's, yeah, wrap. <laughs> <laughs>